Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. We're doing a long-form interview today with a OG veteran, uh, an OG reporter, one of the best in the biz. He's a professor as well, uh, Sean Patrick Griffin, the godfather of Philadelphia Black Mafia history and reporting. He wrote the book Black Brothers, Inc., which is one of the best true crime books ever written. Thank you for joining us. Good to be back again, Scott. So we we had him on um, about a year ago, maybe less than a year, and we talked more kind of in generalities. But uh, this week, uh, we're in the middle of September now. It's the 50-year anniversary of the landmark uh, Philadelphia Black Mafia bust, the first bust of the organization. And it, it was kind of the first domino to fall in the... Um, eventual dismantling of that group, which then we all, the people that have followed the stuff knows that it kind of rejuvenated in the 80s with the, the JBM, the Junior Black Mafia. But um, the original guys, I guess you could kind of say the beginning of the end uh, started in September of 1974. About 12 guys got indicted. And at the top of the indictment was... Eugene Bo Baines, who was the boss at that time of the PBM. So just give give us your take 50 years removed from it. Well, for those for those of you who are not familiar with the story, Philly's Black Mafia had been reigning for at least 10 years, 15 years by that point. Um, and as Scott pointed out, this was a big deal because up until roughly late 1972, early 73, Law enforcement didn't even acknowledge the group. They had intelligence on individual people or clusters of people being arrested in a robbery or in a bank robbery or in a murder, but they weren't piecing it all together as, oh my goodness, these people are running entire sections of the city. They're running heroin along the Eastern seaboard. So when you get to 1974, you correctly point out that Eugene Bo Baines was the main person being indicted in that indictment. It's a little misleading for people who don't know the story. Everyone who watches TV has heard the name Sam Christian and Ron Harvey. They were the two heavies, but they, they were found, placed. They were the most, yeah, they were they were also founding members and they were on the most wanted list for a, a series of murders. And so Bo Bain's rise to prominence in 19 in the summer of 1973. But it's short lived, as you just pointed out, which is by the time the feds catch on to this and they put you know the strike force uh, gets onto it and they put all the resources into it, um, they get to a major drug racketeering indictment, you know, which was noteworthy because the DEA was new. It was a big deal. The idea that they're going to have this massive uh, conspiracy case, the DEA head in DC actually commented, commented on the case. It was that big a deal nationally. And so when Bo Baines and, uh, oh my gosh, Gene Hearn and all the heavy... Other than Ron James, Harvey James and Fox, Sam, Russell Barnes. Yeah, I mean, it was Herschel the entire Williams. leadership from that night, the 1960s iteration of the Black Mafia. They were all picked off over a period of about a week, roughly 50 years ago uh, this week. And um, I, I always like to find the confluence of, you know, pop culture and crime. I'm a big music buff. I think we talked about this the last time you were here, but, you know, drilling down into who Bo Baines is and, uh, Bo ended up doing almost 20 years, uh, came out, I think, in 90-ish, uh, died in 2012. Um, but, you know, before he got locked up, he was the road manager of the Delphonics, which is like, you know, a, a pretty significant part of 1970s soul music. It was kind of the, the defining uh, Philly soul sound. Um, well, for people, our, for people our age and older, if they don't remember, they can go on YouTube. I, I actually show this in my class every once in a while. Yep. The Delphonics had a hit called La La Means I Love You. Yep. Everybody has heard that song. And so to have Bo Baines working on behalf of Philly Groove Records, which owned the Delphonics at that point in time. Uh, and of course, when that hit, the Delphonics didn't want to be a local act any longer. They wanted mm -hmm. to expand their horizons. Well, uh they were leaned on by Bo Baines saying, no, no, I don't think you understand. You know, they wanted John's to get, they wanted to get a new booking agent and um, they wanted to do their own collecting of dues. Exactly. <laughs> and Bo yeah. Baines had a meeting with them and said, no, that's, 
yeah, that's, that's not happening. Yeah, we're yeah, still stating yeah, right. with the and, and by the way, speak, speaking of the music scene, before then, what Bo Beans would do on behalf of of Philly Philly Groove Records, he would go to local disc jockeys and intimidate them to play their records. That was old that's, school, you know, so gangster. Philly, you know. uh, uh, Philly, um, Philly Groove Records, from just my recent research, um, founded in 1967, uh, a, a Philly Black Mafia affiliate. Uh, would you call him a member, John Watson, Stan the Man Watson? I, I, no, I would just say an affiliate. I mean, uh, he, you know, he was clearly immersed in that world, but he wasn't one of the guys who was really doing this, though. And Watson hired Bo. Um, I've talked to, you know, we're here in Detroit here at uh, OG Pod uh, Ground Zero. And uh, first I'll say that Sam Christian was actually hiding out in Detroit from uh, fr from those murder indictments. And uh, was actually caught here and, and was held here for a while. Uh, and I talked to some of the guys that I know that were involved in kind of the darker aspects of Motown. And uh, they all know, they all remember Bo. <laughs> uh, you know, in their mind, and I think it's probably true, uh, Philly Groove, so that, that, that sound that was coming out of Philly was in some ways kind of a response you know, I guess within the industry to Motown, which was coming out of Detroit. And um, so the Motown guys were definitely aware of what was going on in Philly, both Philadelphia, both in the music business, um, obviously, and there was some crossover with the Nation of Islam and all that stuff. But well, they, there's another there's another aspect to this, which is Philly's Black Mafia, like many gangsters, took advantage of the music industry, meaning right, right. when people would tour. That's a great way to launder drug money. It's a great way to launder all sorts of money. You know, they, they would collapse it with the gate. And, yep. you know, there's no way to distinguish what percentage is tickets, what percentage is, you know, sales versus the money that they're laundering through the gate. Smart business. And then they, they uh, around the same time, just piggybacking off what you said, uh, within the more urban music scene, uh, that that space started to again kind of be inspired by stuff that had happened before and then you had a lot of these music festivals with rock and roll and folk music that that were coming up in in the late 60s but by the 70s you started to have uh more r&b fe like festivals um uh, around the country and i know there were a lot of different exactly what you just said these these events with major acts um, that were over a two or three day period, and it was just you know like the open season for for commingling yes. dirty money and skimming and. Well, the thing is, I don't know what it was like in Detroit, but in Philly, especially in Black Philly, um, for people who are not familiar with Philadelphia, like many big cities, it's got you know big sections of the city. One of them is West Philadelphia, and there was a famous strip called the Fifty Second Street Strip, where at that point in time. It was a weird mixture of high life, of commerce, and you would see black gangsters, white gangsters, politicians, celebrities. Well, Philly's Black Mafia ran 52nd Street, including Bo Baines, since we're talking about Bo Baines. Well, what would happen when the music artists would come into town, they would hang out with all these guys. And if they needed heroin, which was the drug of choice at the time, or coke or whatever, they had stash houses. So you could yep. take your woman, you would have an entire apparatus set up for you, and they would... It was that's what I'm saying. Like each party got what they needed out of this arrangement. Yeah, I mean, again, not to the, this is about the Philly Black Mafia. The last thing I'll say here in Detroit about Motown was that uh, there were drug kingpins in Detroit who, like, huge chunks of their business were just what you just said. Like, not only were they helping and providing. Um, you know, resources for, for narcotics consumption and purchase when celebrities were coming into town. In some ways, Eddie, and I'm just going to throw out a name for Detroit, Eddie Jackson, he was kind of like part and parcel of Motown. <laughs> like he was like the drug supply wing of Motown, like all of the, the, uh, of the acts that were into heavier drugs um, had like in-house, supply 
Yes. Yeah. Well, there's, I, I didn't write about it in Black Brothers and I've never named him, but there was a prominent DJ that anybody in Philadelphia for 50 years would have known who was taken out of one of these, uh, you know, I don't know what you would call them, you know, crash pads for the, for mm -hmm. the celebrities where all the stuff was being done and whatever. And they had to take him out one night, but like that was just that world at that time. You know, they didn't think anything of it. And I always question, I don't quite know if the artists really knew what bad dudes they were hanging out with. I know it was fun and flashy and they were getting what they needed, but these people were ruthless. And uh, anyway, so yeah, that was a, it was a fascinating time. It's like they don't they didn't want to know. They didn't ask questions. Could be, could be yeah. The guy has good dope. He dresses nice. He has a nice yeah. car. Uh, and then uh, just to go back to, to, to the Philadelphia aspect of this, and then we'll uh, I'll kind of we'll go more into the um, people in the bus itself. But um, Teddy Pendergrass, he wasn't Philly Groove Records, but he was a legend in the R and B industry at that time. One of the top selling acts, most well known acts. Very handsome, debonair. Was known as a ladies' man. Um, and, you know, Bo Baines was, was very close with Teddy, and um, he was running around with a lot of those guys. And I know there was a – his manager ended up getting killed. Yes, although I have to say I'm familiar with all the things you're talking about, and I've been interviewed about this before. I can only say that during a decade of interviews, and I have every document you can imagine from every federal agency, everything Philly, there's never even a mention of Teddy Pendergrass. Uh, it doesn't doesn't mean it didn't happen. Right. Uh, I'm simply saying that uh, I like I can talk extemporaneously about Muhammad Ali, about any number of people. Yeah. But but I I have nothing to offer with Teddy Pendergrass. That's that. By the way, those revelations are really very new, like in uh -huh. the last ten years. Um, they I knew nothing about it when I heard about them. I followed up with my sources, and they knew nothing. So doesn't mean it didn't happen. But um, you know, well, let's let's go on to what something you just said, and then we'll get into the um into maybe the granulars of the people in the bus, but for people that maybe didn't catch the last interview or aren't, you know, super well-versed in Philly Black Mafia, can you give them like maybe three to five minutes on sure. Muhammad Ali and how his, um, you know, how him as a sports personality and civil rights activist, uh, how his life really tailed with the philadelphia black mafia sure well the the short version of the story is philly's black mafia forms sometime in the late 50s early 60s who the heck knows but by the mid to late 60s they're being arrested in clusters and they're they're ma they're mainly an extortion based syndicate meaning they're not dealing drugs they're extorting drug dealers they're extorting bar owners who are allowing drug dealing to go on in the establishment they're extorting people who are allowing prostitution to take place or gambling to take place in their hotel or in their restaurant or um, or any any of those places so they were an extortion based syndicate now here's the thing you know this and i'm sure your listeners know if you're going to be what we in academia call power syndicate which is based on extortion you can only do that if you commit public acts of violence you can only go up to fellow criminals so many times and say, you're going to pay me X number per week. And you, well, they start calling themselves Philadelphia's Black Mafia. The earliest reference in law enforcement files to Philly's Black Mafia is 1968. That's why I always say, we, and by the way, when I say referenced, they, whoever that person was, there was an informant who listed all the people that we would later come to know 10 years from then all the people who are running everything. But anyway, so they were an extortion based syndicate, mostly in uh, black sections of the city and mostly at the, at the start, only with illicit entrepreneurs. It was only after they gained a lot of clout and a lot of public acts of violence where they started shaking down legitimate businesses. And the key about that is people, when they talk about Philly's black mafia, focus on the murders. I, I get that they're sensational. I mean, they murdered dozens of people mostly high profile murders in public on purpose though, because they wanted people to know who they were. But if you look at their history and at their rap sheets, they don't do time for the murders for the most part. It's very rare that it's the murders that catches them. The, the 1974 case that we're gonna talk about in a little bit, that actually is the evidence of their mistake. The reason that they had this incredible run, if you're able to get five or 10 years doing what they were doing and making that kind of money for that long in the underworld, you're doing a great job. They made the colossal error many people do, which is instead of just taking a percentage of the trade, 
they said, well, why don't we just take over the trade? Well, the problem is, of course, it doesn't matter what a badass you are if you're on a drug wiretap or if you've got the drugs on you. You can't you can't you can't terrorize witnesses. They don't need witnesses. The federal government doesn't need witnesses. So that, that's how they got their start. They expand into legitimate businesses. People, of course, know the infamous uh, January 4th, 1971, DeBrow's Furniture Store case where they went in. uh wasn't really a robbery. There was, it was January 4th. It was a dumb time to do a robbery. Of course, it's after the Christmas season and they don't have much in the till. And that wasn't the point. The point was that they weren't paying the street tax. And so they tied up all the employees, set the building on fire and set the employees on fire. Um, that sort of stuff is what they would do. And they obviously you gain notoriety when you do that. But if you look at the headlines back then, there's no mention of anything called Philadelphia's Black Mafia. Right. And uh, so anyway, that goes that goes on. The other famous case people like to talk about is the uh, 19, April 1972 Club Harlem um, murder in Atlantic City, New Jersey, where in front of four to six hundred people at a nightclub. If, if people have ever seen the movie Scarface, the scene where Al Pacino is all coked up and slunken down in, in, at, the, at the corner booth the in the booth. lounge. That's exactly what happened in the Club Harlem, where Fat Ty Palmer, a major uh, heroin dealer who was uh, a go between between New York City and Philly. Um, long story, but he owed, he owed the Black Mafia guys money. He couldn't pay a debt. They visit him in public on purpose. They march across the dance floor with their guns drawn. It's not a surprise. And they kill him, his bodyguard, and uh, him and people who are with him in the, in the thing. So anyway, that again, this is a major news story. You can't do this in public without a news. But there's no reference in the dozens of news articles to anything called Phyllis Black Mafia because nobody knew. It was that case, by the way, where Atlantic City police called Philly PD and said, hey, we need intelligence on Philadelphia's Black Mafia. And of course, the organized crime unit guy said, what's Philadelphia's Black Mafia? They, they had no idea what they were talking about. So anyway, so you get to 73. By then, Philly's Black Mafia is cruising. They're running heroin throughout all. I think the DEA said it was 60 percent of the city's heroin traffic was controlled by Philly's Black Mafia. They're extorting numbers runners, white and black, all throughout sections of the city. Um, major, major people. Now, getting to your last point about civil rights and Muhammad Ali, by the time you get to 1973, Philly's Black Mafia at that point was totally immersed in the Nation of Islam. The leadership of Philly's Black Mafia were almost all members of the Fruit of Islam, which was the paramilitary faction of the Nation of Islam. So it's not only that they were part of a power, a Black power group that was racial separatist, the leaders were members of the Fruit of Islam. And for those of you who don't know, that was the they were the protectors of the mosque. They were the muscle. They were the muscle. Yeah, exactly. And you and and the, the stories are legendary. I included a few of them in Black Brothers, but one of them is where you would talk to people back then. They would say that if you you could have a brand new Cadillac, park it in the worst neighborhood of the city, roll the windows down, and leave the keys in the dash on the dashboard, and as long as it had Muhammad speaks the Nation of Islam Nation of Islam newspaper on it, no one would touch it. You just didn't mess with the nation. And so for the public, though, it was very confusing because on the one hand, you see them all in their, you know, snazzy tuxes and they look like they're upstanding people who are looking to get better and better the black community. And here they are, they're actually hustlers and, and murderers. And they're using the mosque to hide weapons because back then you couldn't get a search warrant for house of worship. So they, they were informant reports were crazy, whether it was in Philly and other cities, too where the mosques were being used not only to hide people, but to hide things. You mentioned earlier that Sam Christian was caught in 1973 hiding in Detroit. Another guy, Nudie um, Mims, was caught in Chicago. And they weren't, by the way, they weren't caught in Detroit and Chicago. They were caught through the mosques. They were trapped. Yeah, they, 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 they were being hidden by the nation. Exactly. Yeah, they, there was right. this the nation the, the nationwide network of 56 mosques right. where they were just, and of course they had Muslim names, so it was a good cover. And so for law enforcement, which was predominantly white, didn't understand Islam, didn't understand names or whatever. This was a major mess. Never mind the idea that there are actually black organized criminals who are moving this kind of, of money and, and whatever. So anyway, with regard to Muhammad Ali, he, of course, was a Nation of Islam member. One of the people who converted him to the nation was a guy named Jeremiah Shabazz. Jeremiah Shabazz, at the time when he converted Muhammad, was down in Atlanta. He was in the South. But by the time we get to Philly's Black Mafia history, Jeremiah Shabazz is running the Nation of Islam's Temple 12, which is Philly. For those of you who don't know, back then, the nation, every city had numbered mosques. Philly was number 12. And Jeremiah Shabazz was its leader. He was also one of the most influential people nationwide in the, in the movement. He was, I don't know how you would rank people close to Elijah Muhammad, but he was up there. Anyway, 
so he and, uh, and Muhammad Ali and, and Jeremiah Shabazz were very close friends. It was one of his mentors. And when Muhammad Ali gets kicked out of boxing for rejecting the draft, he spends his years in exile in Philly. And that's he bought, how bought he a becomes in such Cherry a Hill. Right. For those of you who don't know, Cherry Hill, New Jersey is a beautiful, well, at least back then, I don't know what it's like now, was a beautiful suburb. And I say suburb of Philly, even though it's in another state, it's right, right. over the bridge, over the Delaware River. And a lot of prominent Philadelphians, uh, whether it was celebrities or people of wealth, would live in Cherry Hill, take the trip across the bridge and do their work and things like that in Philly. Well, that was that was Muhammad Ali. And the person who got him to move to Cherry Hill, New Jersey, was a major person in Philadelphia Black Mafia history named Major Coxon. He, of course, was a flim flam guy, not into violence at all. He was just a hustler. Um, people may know that he ran for mayor of Camden, New Jersey in 1972. He lost to Angelo Arichetti. There's a great anecdote with that. I don't know if I told you last time I was with you, Scott, but the great story is one of the reporters who was offended that Major Coxon, this career criminal, was running for mayor, said, don't you have some nerve running for mayor office with your background? You serve time in federal prison. And Coxon said, in New Jersey, typically people become politicians and then go to prison. I'm reversing the trend. <laughs> and what's great about. about that was Angelo Arichetti was one of the people who got arrested in Abscam. In Abscam. And then, then he was a character uh, played by Jeremy Renner American in the Hustle, movie right? uh, American Hustle. American they just Hustle. changed the name to Carmine Polito that they changed okay, the character. Okay. Well, anyway, so, so you've got all this stuff happening at the same time. You've got a prominent figure in Muhammad Ali. You've got Major Coxon. Now, I have to tell people, I, if you read Black Brothers, you see some of the images. But I, I, I have, I don't know, hundreds of news headlines about all this. And it's not the organized crime stuff that you might think, because we're looking at this backward in history and we know what murderous people these were and what wind up happening to them. But if you're looking at headlines all throughout the 60s and early 70s, these people are glamorized. Major Coxon is getting headline coverage on newspapers in New Jersey. We're talking about Bo Baines. Philadelphia Magazine in 1975, this is after, this is just after the indictment. He was put in their January issue. They had 75 people to watch in 1975. Bo Baines was one of them. Yeah. They were legendary figures in the Philadelphia community. Beyond beyond the underworld. Yes. Yeah. I mean, Major Coxon was a mainstay at City Hall. He was also a mainstay with the nation with the um, NAACP. So if you're if if you're a black community resident and you're being extorted and having your places firebombed or whatever, you can't process all of this because you see these people doing what they're doing to your community, but you also see them on TV. You see them in the newspaper and they're being glamorized as civil rights leaders and community action agency leaders. Because that's one thing I left out in my, my attempt at doing this briefly. That was back in the age of community action agencies where the federal government was giving money purposely. This is what people get wrong. And I was one of them back in the 90s when I started this. They were, they were targeting criminals. The argument was that poverty was causing crime. So if you gave people money, they wouldn't have the need to, to give a crime. There'd be no reason to do crime anymore. So when I got the incorporation documents, I'm thinking that people like Bo Baines or James Fox or whomever, they're not going to list their actual names in these applications. I'm thinking they're going to say Sean Griffin, Scott Burns. No, right. they're actually listing their names because that was how you got the money. And so they had, they had community storefronts, community action agencies. It was unreal what they were doing. With, with and, and by the way, from the we, focus on, we focus on the murders. I love the white collar crime aspect of this because yeah. one of the scams they committed from the community action agencies was they started getting credit cards because they could actually document income. Well, what they wound up using, and they, they made up fake names, of course, got credit cards, and they used them to rent cars, and they became a part of a major car theft ring. There are dozens of examples of that. These are like fascinating criminals. Last thing I want to talk about before we go into the 74 bust, and it's just uh, closing up this uh, last 10 minutes. So Major Coxon gets killed. Uh, June got involved, gets involved in a, a drug ripoff between the Italian mafia in New York and the Philly mob, uh, Philly mobs. Philly by the black way, mafia. It, was, it was the Gambino crime family in New York, right. and they were sending a million dollar shipment to who? Bo Baines, your guy. Which got intercepted. Yeah. Coxon agrees to get the money back, but actually ends up in debt for that money because he had made promises 
uh, that the, he, deal, the deal was that the, his deal was I'll he was going to tell he told the Gambinos I'll get the stuff back and he was going to get paid three hundred grand. He subcontracted two hundred grand to Philly's Black Mafia and said, "Okay, we either need the stuff or the people." Well, I don't. Who knows? It's the underworld. Who the heck knows? Right. But either way, the two drug dealers who stole the th- stole the drugs end up dead. wind up dead right. in Camden. Yeah. So now the Gambinos are furious. They they're not going to get their drugs back or the money. And now the feds are all over the murders. So they stiff Coxon for the money. And Coxon, you know, the talk, clock's ticking on his life because, because Sam Christian and the boys are not too cool about getting stiffed on the 200 grand. They're like, you promised us this money if right. we did this. And we don't care if you're friends with us. And we don't care if you live next door to Muhammad Ali, which yeah. he did. Uh, yeah. Ali bought or purchased or built a mansion right uh, next to Major Coxon. Major yeah. Coxon's killed. At this point, Ali obviously starts to back away a little bit from these people. Yeah. But how much, you know, Ali kind of, comes into their orbit in 68 69 67 68 69 um well that's not, i don't actually i don't know he he uh, when did he uh, he he beat listed in 63 or 64 and then he right after that he converted so but i guess my question is it doesn't really matter what the time on this how in your in your educated opinion did, how much did muhammad ali know about i know he knows that he was surrounded himself with nation people he knew that all the nation people weren't saints i get that but how much did he realize the people that he was socializing with were straight killers that would kill you as quick as they would go get a sandwich at the you know uh, in the middle of a football game yeah i i get that question a lot as you might imagine uh people close to him say he knew say that they knew like they were fully aware. And by the way, according to them, they warned him to get away from this world. They they knew everything that was going on. The thing was, is, look, like you made, Scott, you just made a good point. Like, even if he didn't know the details. But the point, by, by the time you get to that era where they're killing, I mean, people like crazy and making a big deal out of it. Not, not to mention, I'm not, not never, never mind the setting people on fire. They, they were they were, They did a lot of noteworthy things other than just shooting people. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they'd be headed one person, of course, you know, they were legendary for how they did it. Well, the point being when they would go into bars or they'd go into wherever you were with them, everybody knew don't mess with that crowd at the end of the table. You know what I mean? And so it wasn't simply that they were a nation of Islam members or that they were Philly Black Mafia. Um, he and his crowd knew knew whether they knew the details of the murders, who the heck knows. But, yeah, they, he knew he was running with a really rough crowd. And then it went from somebody that was very proud to at least with major coxon he was very proud of his association he was shouting him out in the ring he grab grab a mic from howard cosell start shouting major coxon on the and then after major coxon is murdered muhammad ali when he's asked about it was like i barely knew the guy yeah he said he, and he also said that uh, major coxon was not a muslim so i couldn't be friends with him Oh, okay, and yet, so I mean, and by the way, before then, he had called Major Cox not only a close friend, but it was his financial advisor. Yeah. And like you said, that's literally why he moved. That's why he moves the doors away I mean, from him or whatever. Very close. Incidentally, you can find all this stuff on YouTube. These right. these interviews are all over the place where he's talking about Major Cox and back in 1972. So let's go to September of 74. And then I want to just lay something out for you and then just let you go. Let you loose. Uh, so I learned from from researching this the last couple of days. Um, I learned about how this bus came together and I want to kind of get your take on it. Uh, Bo Baines was the number one defendant in this case, but number two defendant was James Fox, who I'm told by some people called him uh, fifth street, Jimmy. Uh, he was a guy that was a, from what I can gather was a former, what used to be a part of some like youth groups that had nothing mm-hmm. to do with yes. crime. Yes. And then he was put in charge. Once uh, Billy Black Mafia got uh, stood up, he was put in charge of basically like consolidating heroin dealers in North Philly, lining them up to get behind the Black Mafia family. And then going into these youth centers that he used to be a part of and like transforming them into like feeder groups for uh philly black mob and all that stuff so he has a common law brother-in-law 
named Mickey Robinson, who isn't jammed up, unprompted, walks into the DEA office in March of 1974 and says, you know, I'm a tool, I'm an instrument, use me to take down my uh, brother-in-law and his and his and his group and for the next six months or uh, he's wiring up and making yeah. phone calls and making uh, drug buys and can you just talk about how this all came, went down I'm here? glad you referenced Charles Mickey Robinson because if you study the decades of Philly's black mafia history he's the only informant people would not talk about Philly's black mafia it's one of the biggest challenges. I actually write a lot about that in the book. I interviewed so many people in federal law enforcement or in Philly or DAs. They, they just couldn't get people to cooperate. And by the way, some of the DAs actually didn't want people to cooperate because they knew they couldn't protect them. That's how rough it was back then. And Robinson, well, oh, this is the last thing I'll say, Robinson yeah. was like best friends at one point, was best friends with James Fox yeah. and felt, from, from reading what I read, felt yeah. personally offended to yes. some degree that Fox was going back into these old youth centers Right. And corrupting these 10, 11, 12 yeah. year olds. There's also a quote in the book where Charles Mickey Robinson said that um, one of the things that really offended him was, quote unquote, they were misusing Islam. And what had happened, he left Philly and he, like you say, he leaves James Fox and all these people in legitimate efforts to, you know, take care of gang warfare and get kids out of harm's way and things like that. Comes back to find them manipulated, just like you say, as feeder groups or whatever. One, that's why the, by the way, for people who don't know, the reason the book is called Black Brothers Incorporated is because that's their most infamous community action agency, which was run by James Fox uh, and Gene Har and um, Gene Hart, uh, Gene, Gene Hart, Gene Hart. And uh, anyway, so James Fox, by the way, was called by Councilman Folietti. He called him the next Martin Luther King Jr. They honestly believe that this crowd of people led by James Fox were going to be the solution to urban warfare and problems with teenage gang violence. And so when Ch Mickey Robinson comes back, he can't believe, can't believe what he sees. And like you say, he goes and, and volunteers himself and they wire him up. And that but importantly, and I'm sure your audience knows this, but people don't, this matters because what happens next couldn't have happened a few years earlier. For people who don't know the history of this, we only get wiretapping in 1968, and then the Organized Crime Racket, Organized Crime Control Act is 1970, and that's where you get all the witness protection stuff. And so, you, the tools that are going to be used against Philly's Black Mafia in late '73 and '74, you couldn't have done it a few years earlier. I always say, if Philly's Black Mafia had started a decade earlier, this would have gone on another decade. They just they were hitting their stride at the wrong time because federal authorities were figuring out how to use all these new tools. It did the one thing that I that I noticed, and I want to get your insight on. It seemed like the guy, and and it wasn't when when Robinson started cooperating and wearing wires and doing deals. He wasn't just dealing with James Fox. He was dealing with a lot of these other um, dangerous, notorious figures in James Fox orbit. The one that I know comes to mind, I saw some wires and it was Herschel Williams, what they called the Jolly Green Giant, yeah. who was like, you know, very imposing and and loved the, loved the job as an enforcer. He'd eventually die by the sword as well. But uh, it looked like Mickey Robinson didn't have to do a lot of creating it, it looked like they were okay dealing yes. drugs with him which makes right. me believe he wasn't necessarily a fully uh, not just a straight arrow regular civilian if he's a if and maybe i'm wrong unless they just said oh well now he wants to work with us so we'll start giving him drugs but it just it seemed very like seamless like he was immediately negotiating drug deals um with these guys at a level that they would only be dealing with people that they knew in that world well, the thing is, uh, back then, gangs were a really big deal. But when I say ga gangs in the 60s were, are different than now, right. where people were in gangs just for territory. They weren't necessarily uh, dealing drugs or murdering people or anything like that or whatever. I think Charles Robinson was familiar in that realm where he was street savvy and could get by or whatever. And so I think he could talk the talk and be in, and be in that world without blinking an eye. Uh, and so when he came back and it had flipped, yeah, I, I don't really know the answer to that question, but I can imagine him being savvy enough to be able to 
you know, seamlessly go through all that sort of stuff. I just, I found that interesting when I was going through stuff that I was like, it didn't take him a lot of time to get to the point where he was asking these guys like, Hey, feed me and feed me more than just for my personal use. Right. Um, and then all of a sudden, all of these major players are kind of engaging with him. It just made me, and I wanted to point this out to the audience because it sounds like a guy that just shows up at the DEA headquarters with no case hanging over him, and it's not like he's being jammed to cooperate. He did so. I guess my initial impression was, oh, this guy was kind of a square and just didn't like no, what was going no, no, on. No, but no, maybe no, there's, no. there's a middle ground there. Well, the other thing too is don't forget that the, the infamous 20th and Carpenter Street gang was always going at it with Philly's Black Mafia, right? Uh, and that plays a role too. So I, I just I just think he was he was in that world, and it, I don't think it shocked anyone that he would be hanging out with them. And I don't think don't forget he hasn't been around, so they have right. nothing to fear. They know him from three or four years earlier, so they incorporate him back into the scene, even though the scene is different now. And they went to trial pretty quickly. It looked like the trial was in seventy five. Yeah. yeah, March of seventy five. Um, yeah. And well, te Herschel, te technically speaking, there were three trials. The big one was right. March of 75. Herschel Williams is killed in 75 yeah. by his brother in law or in a dispute with his brother in law and some other guys. So I think that was when he was out on bond before he hit trial. Um, but most of these guys are convicted. And if you read Black Brothers Inc., it and this is my kind of Sean does such a great job of like really. The, building a narrative that is like a beginning, a middle, and an end. And you had a, a, a succession of guys throughout the, the rest of the decade that tried to keep things moving forward, but it seemed like every time somebody would pop up and try to take things over, he'd be killed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there were just different iterations to the point where it just kind of they ceased to exist by the early 80s. And then right. by the mid to late 80s, JBM came up. But that really exactly. wasn't the same right. anywhere really. JBM no, no, no. was well, a drug. It was, it was a drug gang. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Different than yeah. what. Uh, yeah. Was uh, right. Well, that's you, what you just said is exactly right. When By the time you get to the late 70s. But here's the thing. you I'm sure you know this from all the other guests you've had on. Even for Italian gangsters in Philly, once the feds figured out how to do this, that's when you started seeing more internecine warfare, because mm -hmm. now there's a real fear of informants because it's so easy between the witness protection program and being able to wire people. Leaning on people for decades and decades was not a problem because no one's recording anything. You don't have to worry about that. And they were correctly fearful for their lives. Well, now there was an entire mechanism to deal with that. So um, that's why you see, like, in, with, with the Italian guys, once Bruno is killed, it's chaos ever since yeah. in 1980. Ever, ever since. Yeah, I mean, so yeah. so that's what I'm saying. So Philly's Black Mafia, going back to what I said earlier, had they not made the mistake of trying to commandeer drug territories, you know, who knows that would have happened, but that's what they did. And like Black Brothers, I believe there were seven people at the opening of Black Brothers as, exe as, as executives. Five are in the picture that I put in the book, and there are two off screen. Five of them wind up being killed from other people in the in the picture. Right. Like they all start killing each other over, over the I mean, just that's that's that world once you're in the drug world. So as we are we're gonna wrap up, we got about five, six, seven more minutes. I want to touch on another person in the bus that uh we haven't talked about yet, and then I want to draw a line to the JBM and and just ask you a question about today. So Russell Barnes was one of the people in the 74 bust. Um, it looks like he was, according to the indictment, he was in charge of the Little Brothers, which were like the Gophers and the teenage Aaron boys. He was in charge of kind of recruiting. Uh, it looks like a lot of guys that he, let's say, mentored at that time period, as well as guys that Nudie Mims mentored. Um, eventually become junior black mafia but russell barnes ends up dead he, he he's killed in 1986 can you just in maybe two minutes give us well, how did that happen sure well for people who don't know the story russell barnes was not simply a feeder person he was not mentor he was not just mentoring he was a contract killer uh he was a very small person 
it's weird. The Phillies Black Mafia had big guys. Sam Christian, Nudie Mims. Yeah. These are tall. They look like linebackers. They look like linebackers in that. Yeah. And this, is, and this is an era where people aren't lifting weights. They were just naturally big guys. Right. And yet Russell Barnes is this short guy. I don't know, 5'7", maybe? I mean, short compared to the, the rest of the one else. Well, anyway, um, he was known for violence. And um, by the time he got killed, it was all, again, it was drug drug territories, whatever. But with regard to the gangs that he was nurturing, <laughs> poor, poor choice of words, what they were doing, though, it wasn't just getting them used as drug carriers or whatever. They would go around to all the storefronts and they would tell them that you had to get a sticker. And the sticker was this this property protected by Black Brothers Incorporated. And plenty of people would say, oh, no, thank you. We're fine. This is a perfectly safe neighborhood. <laughs> and they would say, no, you don't understand. It's a really bad neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, if they didn't pay the street tax, they'd get firebombed or someone would get hurt or whatever. That was what happened. But again, if you're a black resident and you're seeing posters all over telephone poles and billboards and in, in the newspaper, you know, we're protecting from gang warfare. You know, I always viral joke, mar it was viral marketing before the term viral. Was, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I always you know, joke they may actually have lessened gang warfare it's only because they were everyone was petrified of them. But um, anyway, so that's what Russell Barnes main job was. And uh, he was killed over a lucrative drug tour, drug territory. Last two questions. First is a question about yesteryear. And then the last question I'll ask is about kind of today. Sam Christian, I read in, in some of these files I had the other day. It looked like he comes out of prison and attempts to muscle into the junior black mafia but like kind of does it on the sly where he's like, I can be somebody that yes. makes sure that everybody gets along, but wink, wink. I want all your business. Yeah, that's what, but it, yeah, but it doesn't, it. Yes. It doesn't, but it didn't work. Right. No, right. Exactly. Yeah, he, he wants the benefits without any of the costs. That's what, so that's how, what he how, wanted. How did those, how did Aaron Jones and those guys keep him at bay? I think by that point he was, I mean, I, I don't think he had anywhere near the street reputation and, uh, Apparently, and look, in his earlier years, street repetition would have been irrelevant. He just would have taken action, but but that was over. Um, I don't know. I think I know in his later years, he was nowhere near as aggressive because uh, his camp reached out to me multiple times to write a book about him. Okay. And uh, and that was one of their arguments to me, which is, look, that life is over. You know, he, he just he wants to make amends. So when did he die? When did Sam Christian die? Oh, geez. Is it was it in the last decade or was it back in the? Because uh, Bo oh, Baines died in twelve. Bo Baines died in twelve. Two thousand twelve. Yeah, I, I think it was there. since. I think it's since then. I think it's since I, I've been in, I've been at the Citadel now for ten years. I think it's since I got here. I just I know because I actually I wound up writing uh, an article for Philadelphia Magazine summarizing Sam Christian's significance in Philadelphia history. And I'm pretty sure I did that down here, but I, I don't really know offhand. All right. So so last question as we wrap up. Even though Philadelphia Black Mafia is long gone, there are still JBM guys, Junior Black Mafia guys, that are active. I don't know if it's an organization per se. Um, the original group, Philly Black Mafia, as well as the Junior Black Mafia, did a lot of business with the Italians. Um, they seem to be... In some case, I don't. I don't want to speak for uh, Sam and Ron because they didn't seem to be enamored by anybody. But certain people in those groups seem to be enamored by the Italians. Right now, Joey Merlino, um, who is, you know, has been the face of the Philadelphia Mafia for thirty years. If you do, you know, you just do a regular Google image search, um, you find a lot of photos, and some of them in the last couple of years with a number of JBM guys. Um, the, the names that I, you know, Benny Goff, Tracy Mason, and those guys. Um, what, what, what do you make of that? Well, first of all, that's news to me. I'm not shocked, but uh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. I just know that, they, look, they, my focus obviously was on Philly's Black Mafia where people like Lonnie Dawson were dealing with Long John Martirano for years. Right. Um, right. And, and, you know, they were dealing this stuff for years together in and out of prison. 
And so um, when the JBM guys came along and they were doing what we talked about this last time I was on the pod, I mean, they, yeah. they were, they were, again, these were like friendly, they'd hang out, socialize together and all that sort of stuff. And then when Ram squad came along, you saw the same thing, which was short for Richard Allen mafia, which was one of the big drug, mm -hmm. drug territories in Philly with a lot of black mafia lineage lineage um, same sort of thing. Because there's all the Italians, I don't know about Joey Merlino in particular, but they love the hip-hop scene. They love the flash. They love all the attention that all these guys were getting. And not to mention, they could obviously do deals together. So I don't know if they're still active today. I, I Do you know? Is your sense that they're still active on the street? Do I know if who? Are we talking about JBM? Joey Merlino and those guys. Yeah. With Are they are they still yeah, 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 like the, the Philadelphia Mafia active? is still it, The Philadelphia Mafia is still very active. There was actually just a report this week. I'm saying with the this. JBM guys. Y yes, the Philadelphia Mafia um, is still doing business with the JBM. Um, I've reported that. I know that Tracy Mason particularly has been around Joey Merlino in the last couple of months. Uh, Merlino is... This is a... This is a, <laughs> this is a very... Uh, tenuous subject for me because Joey Merlino has kind of taken a lot of my reporting personally and has been really been coming after me uh, quite vociferously. Uh, so I don't want to go too much into it, but Joey has some issues with other Italian mob guys. So he has to kind of be careful where, where he's traveling and where he's going. And I've been told Tracy Mason is kind of, running part of his security right now when he comes into Philadelphia and you know Tracy Mason is OG JBM. That would make sense. I like that. All right. Whatever that's worth. I'm well, not thank you so you. much, I Sean. I got a hard out at five. Yeah. Yeah, no, I have no problem talking about it. I've reported it. Um okay. and uh th thank you so much. And this was great. I think we did a good job of covering everything we needed to cover. You're always welcome back. I love uh, talking to you know fellow authors and historians and people that nerd out on this stuff like I do. So this was great. Thank you, Sean. Thanks a lot, Scott. Please, everyone, everyone, check out Black Brothers Inc. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. Um, it I'm, I'm not just saying this because Sean's here. I, I fell in love with this book a good 10, 15 years before I ever met Sean. Um, it's truly one of the one of the great true crime books. Uh, you know, of this generation of the last 25, 30, 40 years, please check it out. Sean, tell everyone else where they can get anything that uh, else in terms of stuff. Well, thank you very much for the nice words. Uh, obviously the book's available anywhere you would get books. Uh, you can also see a ton of analysis on my website, which is seanpatrickgriffin.net or .com. I actually own both now. Uh, and I, you can follow me on Twitter at SPG author and Twitter is kind of boring. I, sh I should say X, I guess, is boring. But uh, anything that involves my research stuff, I post there. Any news items, if my guys are back in the news, which I'm, it still happens, I post stuff. But my website has all sorts of analysis that's ex way beyond the book. Because even though the book was written in 2007, that many of them didn't stop doing things. And so I update the site instead of just writing another edition of the book. In fact, does it? Someone got arrested in. 15 or 16. I'm trying to remember who it was. Someone rather significant. Ricardo McKendrick. Yeah. The largest cocaine seizure in Philadelphia right. history. We talked about the last time. Yeah. Perfect. And he's, he, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. No. no, no just, I, get, I get confused with my own content. <laughs> now, too, which is a little bit different. Uh, more analysis, more, you know, kind of insider nerdy stuff than you get on just the straight YouTube, but you're going to get the interview uh, both on both platforms. So, Thank you so much, Sean. I'll see you guys next week. I'm Scott Bernstein, OG Pod, out.